praise God. <clears throat> so we are a church that is closely connected to the Air Force, obviously. And because of that relationship, we've been serving Air Force families since we've existed. And as someone who's been born and raised in Dover, Delaware, uh, I have experienced the loss of amazing families who are uh, planted here and then have to leave after a, a certain amount of time, and maybe a year or two years. Some, there's a joke going around the Air Force, though, that once in Dover, it's over or something like that. <laughs> They're kind of stuck here, you know. <coughs> and I guess some of my friends didn't get stuck here. And uh, I remember getting really close to a lot of my friends. And, and then all of a sudden, after three years, they're gone. And they got deployed somewhere else with their parents. And it was hard. And one of the things we used to say to each other is, hey, hey stay, stay in touch. Let's keep in touch. And so we would try, and we would do our best. But you know how life is. Over time, things just kind of get busy, and there's disruptions and distractions. And, and by the way, uh, keeping in touch when I was a, a kid or a teenager was much different than it is today, isn't it? Yeah. It's a little easier now with social media and the Internet. But does anyone remember? Look at this picture. Does anyone remember this, this life yeah. right here? So I heard some young adults say, wow, you know. Um, now, you would go to Radio Shack, which is a store that did exist. It might still exist. I think it exists. And uh, you would buy like a 40-foot cord to go from your kitchen, right, where the central place of the phone was to get some privacy to talk to your friends. And you would drag that cord all the way to your bedroom, and that's what it would look like. At least that's what my sister's room looked like for three hours. <laughs> there was one person in our family who definitely stayed connected to her friends, and that was my sister. I'm trying to get homework assignments that I forgot to get, and she's talking to a friend for three hours. I just need the phone for two minutes because of my irresponsibility, and she is hogging the phone. So what do you do? You go to the kitchen and you just put your finger on. <laughs> Oops, bad connection. And then that's when the, everything broke loose in our house. So, you know, this isn't actually too far off with the context of our scripture today in John 15. Jesus is heading to the cross and then he would, uh, he would die, be buried in the tomb. He would rise again three days later. And then he would spend some time with the disciples and his followers. And then he would ascend into heaven after that short period of time with them. And he is instructing them before he goes through this journey to stay in touch. To stay connected to me. And so I want to go to John 15, 1 through 8. And I think it's very interesting that Jesus would even say the words remain in me or stay connected to me. Even though he's departing and leaving earth, he's saying stay connected. That means that it's possible to do that if Jesus is telling us to. That means that if he's not even present physically, we can stay connected to him still spiritually. And so this is important for his disciples because they love him. And at this point, Jesus is calling them his friends. We are Jesus' friends. And he's wanting to connect and stay close to us. And so he actually gives us how to do that. But here's the thing. He doesn't break it down in this little portion of scripture. And he doesn't completely explain it uh, to us in the word of God. But it must be that they understood what he was saying. And I'm going to help us understand. How does one remain or abide in Christ when he's not even physically present? The answer an important question to look at. So John 15, turn to your Bible there, and we'll also have on the screen for you, one through eight. It says this, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce even more. 
You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Who's who in the scripture? We see that God is the gardener who oversees the garden of life or life. And Jesus is the true grapevine. Now, it's important that we understand why did he say, why didn't he just say vine? Why did he say true grapevine? Well, the reason is because he's speaking to Jews. And their connection was to Israel in Jerusalem. Their connection was to Moses and Abraham. And he's saying that they're not the true vine. They're not your true heritage. I am your true heritage. I am your true life source. So Jesus is the vine and it sends life to the branches. We are the branches. And it's a weird analogy, isn't it? It's allegory of who we are, our relationship with God. Because physically, we don't just always stay connected to God in a sense and because we're not really branches. But maybe we are truly connected to God at all times, more than we realize. And what's really interesting about these jobs, and by the way, there's one missing, and Andrew Murray in his book, The True Vine, he says this, that the Holy Spirit is the sap that goes from the vine to the branch. So the Trinity is actually in here or it's implied. So one thing I want us to grasp today is that the job of the vine, Jesus Christ, is one thing, to feed his branches. Now think about that for a second. Jesus has one sole purpose here now, after he's done all of his work for God, now his one job is to feed you and I life. But there's only one problem. We got to slow down and be still. I think this altar time today, this time when we worship together in our seats, and wow, God was speaking to us before I even preached to be still in his presence. I felt the Holy Spirit move in this room when Sam was talking about that. Because if we slow down enough, we will find life come to us through Christ. Because his one job is to do that. And so our one job as a branch is to remain in him. Wouldn't it be weird to see a branch walk away from a vine? That would be really weird physically. It's really hard to connect this allegory and this this analogy. But the reality is, is we can stop receiving life to the branch. And so that branch withers and dies. And that really does happen in real life. The branch will stop wanting to receive life or Who knows what reason? It could be insects. It could be whatever. I don't know. I'm not that guy that studied that stuff. But it it can wither. I've seen them. I've chopped them off myself off trees. And what do I do? If I don't have a fire pit, I throw them away. I dump them. And so we can actually reject the life source that we need. And the one thing that he's doing is trying to give us his life and everything of him. And it's wild to think that he enjoys doing it. And, and the thing is, is one of the observations I take from the scripture is that Jesus wants to be close to us. He wants to have fellowship with us. And the result of that is going to be fruit. Now, what is the fruit? The fruit is the character of Christ. Paul says it's the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, faithfulness, goodness, patience, self-control, and many other things. The love of Christ, the joy of Christ. Everything about Jesus is ours. Everything. Even his gifts. He gave us his gifts to, to be a light and to make an impact 
in our world, and it's all ours. And if we abide in him, we have fruit. But the progression of the scripture says more fruit, and then it says much fruit. So the longer or the more that we abide and are aware of Christ in our lives, the more we come to him and sit still and and connect with him, the more fruit that we're going to have. And the cool thing is, that means we're going to glorify and change the people around us. We're going to glorify God and change the people around us. Jesus wanted his disciples to grow. But here's the thing. One of the things that wrecked me when I was reading Andrew Murray's The True Vine, the purpose of growing was not completely all for them. It was so that they could go make disciples and change the world. And Sam said that as well. The Holy Spirit had already started preaching before I came up. Because he said, we cannot take everything in and then never pour it out. We have to let it overflow out of us to everyone around us. God has already been preaching before his word was declared today. That we cannot keep receiving and then keep it to ourselves. We have to give out the hope of Jesus Christ to our lost and dying world. It's not just for us. He says that you would glorify me. You will be my true disciples if you abide and have much fruit. This all applies to us. And understand this. This is the context. The context is that Jesus is talking to his followers. His dedicated, devoted, even though they, one of them messes up later, right? A couple of them do. I love that, by the way. Jesus knew full well that Judas was going to do what he did. Jesus knew full well that Peter was going to deny him three times. Jesus knew full well that Thomas would doubt him. And he still loved him and called him friends. He loves you and he calls you a friend. There's still time to turn around. We're in Christ if we're a believer. So remaining in him is possible if we will turn around and stay connected to him. Praise God for that. So what does it mean to abide? What does it mean? It means ongoing connection, trust, and dependence in him. Now, all believers are already in Christ spiritually, and Christ dwells in us through his spirit. So we have a union with him. I want to bring out an illustration for you, and uh, Cornelius is going to bring this out to help us. I'm going to show you this. What what does it mean to abide? All believers are in Christ, Paul says. So you are spiritually in Christ. The word says you are hidden in Christ. So we want to help show this. And by the way, this is the beauty. Thank you, gentlemen. This is the beauty of communion. It is a reminder of being one with Christ. And in Christ, every time we take it, we are saying, Jesus, I am in you. I am with you. I know I'm aware of you, and I live in you. But Jesus says, remain in me, so continue that connection. Now, I need to take my jacket off real quick to show you something, okay? (laughs) I'm going to reach in here. Do you guys see anything inside this jar or this vase? If you do, you have really good eyes. So this represents the life of Christ. And on Tuesday, uh oh, it's melting. I have a little tiny water bead right here. It's that small. I put this in there on Tuesday. And it's been sitting in Christ this entire time. And if I reach down in here, I'll actually grab out a few, just, or let's just do two so I don't drop it and mess everything up. Now, do you see these? These have been sitting there since Tuesday, and they were white and they were clear. And now they're green and they've grown. And that represents that if we continue spiritually, if we're aware 
that we live in Christ wherever we go and whatever we do, he is with us, then we will grow because that's what he does. That's all that Jesus is here. This is the life source and we just stay in the source. But I do got to show you something that kind of hit me this morning. And uh, if I could just kind of twist this a little bit and say, Here, here's life and here's what life does. Life will suck out a lot of what's going on around us and take out some of that Jesus in our lives. And I wish I had a lot less in here, but I had to hide all those beads. So that didn't work. But imagine, because I did it earlier this week, imagine that I continue to drain this and suck this out with this sponge. Life has a way of, of really just kind of taking Jesus uh, or taking your mind off of Jesus because he's not gone. He's still there. But what happens is we, uh, we allow things to get in the way and just suck away the presence of Christ out of our lives. I'm going to squeeze... I'm going to squeeze Jesus back in here. It's where he belongs. Oh, no. <laughs> Very good. It's interesting, though, how I didn't expect those to get that big and to grow that big. But it even changed in color, didn't it? See, people will see a difference in your life the more you stay connected to Christ. So how, how do we do it? Well, there's a Christian word called devotions. We've made that word up. But it's a good word to remind yourself. It has to do with being devoted. A devoted time to God to hang out with him and fellowship with him. A a time set aside and uh, to, to read the Bible, to pray, to listen and I think that's really important, by the way. We need to slow down and listen a little bit. Let, let the word sink in. I love, you know, the, the whole reading plans of like reading the Bible in a year and getting it done like three and a half chapters a day. I think those are great. But I want to encourage you to, to consider slowing down enough to actually hear because you're, you're, you're reading the holy word of God, not a reading plan. And God wants to connect with you in that reading plan. Now, for some of us who, who need to start this devoted life or devotional life, yeah, you may need structure to begin, and then after a while, time goes by, and you're like, wow, 15 minutes is already done, and I'm not even finished. I want to keep going. But there is, there is a need for structure sometimes in our lives where we get going and we set off right, a launching pad. I think that these devoted times, these devotionals need to be daily, not sparse. And I also think the second thing is we can abide with God all day. Because if Jesus was physically gone, how do they do that? We can abide. Now, we can't read our Bible all day, can we? So what can we do? We can meditate on the Word of God all day. We can think about what we read that morning or the night before. And we can write Scripture verses down and keep them in our car or on our phones. Thank God for that. But here's how we abide all day. Faith connects us all day. I believe that I'm never alone wherever I go. I operate under the understanding that God is with me and that because of that, I can talk to him wherever I go. So prayer helps us abide all day. I can thank him and I can praise him and worship him wherever I go. Do you know I was watching a football game? It wasn't the one where the Eagles... We're losing <laughs> because Wentz got hit in the back of the head. That was messed up, but it happens. Do <laughs> you know that I was sitting down and I was hanging out with some friends watching the game and I just sat there and I said, thank you, God, that I even get to do this. I, was, I should have been thinking about my wings and my chips or whatever, which were good. But I was like, God, I just want to say thank you that I have friends in my life that I have at home to watch this game in. I don't know. I just thought that that was important. Because every once in a while, God just says, I'm here. Because he's always there. Jesus is always there because he is the vine that doesn't leave. He's always there. 
And so we can abide all day through faith, knowing he is there. But sometimes the Holy Spirit, if we're sensitive enough and we're listening, he will nudge us to do things for him. Sometimes he'll whisper to say things for him. And then we can center our lives around God all year. So I know, for, I know right now, 52, 52 times this year, there is 52 weeks, right? 52, it doesn't feel like it sometimes. 52 times I'm going to be in church this year. And then I know I'm going to be at some conferences or ones that we host so I can receive from God. And then I know that I'm going to spend time in, in prayer nights and prayer weeks and worship nights. And then if I break it down even more, I know that I'm going to have my daily time with God to hang out with him. And I'm starting to look at that, look at that and go, wow, I'm centering my life around God. I, my day, listen, my day revolves around God. God doesn't revolve around my day. At least that's my goal. That's what I strive for. That's what I strive for. God isn't a part of my daily life. God is my life. Amen. That's important we understand that. God created this day. God ordained for this day to exist. So God gets this day. And I get to live in this day. This goes back to my first sermon for First Things First. That it's God's will. It's God's year. Put him first. And so God gets my day. And so everything else has to squeeze in, not God. Come on now, let's not squeeze God in. He's worthy of not being squeezed, amen? Amen. amen? amen. But what's amazing is, is a lot of us go, okay, I need to abide, I need to remain, I need to connect. So we go right to devotions, right to the set time of 15 or 30 minutes. But the reality is, is as soon as you leave your house, he is still with you and you can talk to him. Now, should you pray with your eyes closed while you're driving? Absolutely not. I don't recommend that. That's just dangerous. What is abiding? Abiding is faith and awareness that Jesus is all I need and always with me. It's a heart that says Jesus is all I need and he's always with me. And there's one more way to abide I didn't add on here. And that's that we live like Christ. Because it's not all about what we get in our private time. It's also how we live in public. In 1 John 2, 6, a life verse of mine says this. Those who say, write that down, 1 John 2, 6. Those who say they live in God should live their lives as Jesus did. So when I leave today and I live like Christ, I'm remaining in Christ. I'm abiding in Christ. I'm taking Christ with me through faith because I centered him around my entire day. I spent devotions with him. I'm going to be at prayer night tonight. I'm going to be at prayer this week. I'm going to be at different things all year abiding in Christ. And all of that is intentional. And then sometimes he shows up and surprises you like he did this morning and wrecks you a little bit and says, be still. And I love that. But here's the thing, abiding is under attack. The devil doesn't want you to abide with Jesus because he knows that that's the life source for you as a believer and a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. So he's attacking you with a lie that God isn't there. Well, let me tell you a quick story, not to boast about myself and not to, to do anything like that. I just want to share an example. I'm on a plane four years ago going to Dominican Republic. And I'm talking to God before I get there because I was scared about all the stuff we had to do as, as missions work. And I had to speak three times. I don't speak Spanish. That's rough. And so I'm nervous. And I'm praying, and, I, and I, I had a random question for God. I said, God, what is my spiritual gift? I've been reviewing the spiritual gifts at the time. God, what is my spiritual gift? Because I feel like I operate in different things. And then I began to pray about other things, and then I started reviewing for my messages. Six to seven days later, it's the last day, I'm preaching a message to the church that hosted us all week. And um, I, I do an altar time where people can respond to give their, their life to Christ, and it, it bombed. 
like three or five people may have responded to that. It was just like no, it was, no one was coming forward. And all of a sudden, this frail little grandmother, they call her abuela or abuela? Abuela? Is that right? Yes, abuela. I'm getting it. She comes up and she's crying. And I'm like, oh, man. And so my interpreter says, hey, come down here. She wants to speak to you. I said, okay, she, she's got a word from the Lord for you. I've never met this lady in my entire life. She goes, and she's, I have my interpreter explain it. She says, you've been asking God what your spiritual gift is. I, I, didn't even, I was like, whoa. I mean, I, I'm aware of this because this, this church, we believe in the gifts of the spirit. We operate in the gifts of the spirit. So I know this happens, but I've never seen this lady in my entire life. And she's like, you've been asking God what your spiritual gift is. It's prophecy. And then she began to talk about how it would be the pastor at Calvary Church. Four years ago, a lady I never met in my entire life. Now, first of all, I share that story to unbelievers so they know that God is real. Amen. And maybe the reception was just better because I was about 20 to 30,000 feet up in the air. So God could hear me a lot better. Because I was praying on the airplane. <laughs> you see, God is real, and God is listening to our words to him. And a random question, I, I, to be honest with you, I was kind of haphazardly praying. I was kind of just, you know, I, I, was just trying, I was just trying to talk to God and just like, God, you know, just, but I wasn't like, I was going through a list, you know, I was kind of rushing through my list. And he stopped to mention that one through a lady I never met in my entire life. That's God. So God is there, and he's listening. Don't listen to the devil. That's right. And then we can get so busy, and there's so many distractions. Come on now, we know this. Yeah. It's so busy. It's like the way we think in our culture is that we can change a tire while, the, while we're driving a car. <laughs> That's how busy we are. <laughs> Let me change this tire real quick. It's crazy. We don't know how to slow down. Daniel Henderson, who writes a lot about prayer and teaching churches to pray. He said, the devil doesn't have to destroy us, just distract us. We'll destroy ourselves because we'll get away from the life source of Jesus Christ. The devil doesn't have to destroy us, he just has to distract us. Preoccupation with ambitions and dreams and money and belongings and entertainment, people, and all of it isn't an issue. None of that is an issue until it becomes an issue. And when they fill our days, and those days turn into weeks, and weeks turn into a month or more, that we're not connecting with God, then it becomes a problem, doesn't it? But can I tell you something? It becomes a problem when we let it happen in the beginning. When we don't guard that time in the beginning, and we start seeing ourselves disconnect from God, and not be in church, or, or not be in groups, and, and not be in our personal devoted time, or not talking to him all day, it becomes a problem as soon as we start compromising in the beginning, because Satan's like, yes, I'm doing it. I'm getting them distracted from the life source. So how do we counter? I need to hurry. How do we encounter or, or counter that attack? The first thing I would say is, is you have to fast some things in your life. You have to go without. And I need to talk about that more in the future to help us understand. We need to go without something. See, going without something makes room to do something else. And God should not be dropped. Everything else should be dropped. Amen. Sometimes we have to intentionally occupy. And by the way, one of the things that, you know, this week I'm going to fast, just the fact that I'm here, being at prayer week means I'm fasting something else, isn't it? So just to give you a simple teaching of, of fasting. Intentionally occupy. Sometimes we have to storm the castle of our hearts and minds with Jesus. To be intentional and simply devote a distraction-free time with God. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, is if we actually just go ahead and commit to filling a certain devoted time for God, the, waste, the wasted time, it doesn't, it doesn't get spent. Because you just put in what's good and everything else is bad gets out. And here's something that God was speaking to me this past week. I'm reading in the Old Testament. It had nothing to do with this. And I'm reading my Bible. And, and he says, when we slow down and wait long enough to meet with God, we'll discover he was always there waiting patiently for us. Now, I changed it the way he said it because he was saying me, but I feel like that's also for all of us. 
Ryan, if you slow down enough and wait long enough for me, you'll discover that I'm always there waiting patiently for you. See, he's always there because he's the vine. He doesn't stop doing what he's doing. But if we will slow down long enough to find out he's still there, we will discover him and have an experience with him. And lastly, he's just worthy of our day. God is worthy of our attention and our time and our hearts. Amen? Amen. He is worthy of it. So church, I want to encourage you to fight for that connection with Jesus Christ. To fight by fasting. Intentionally occupy your hearts and mind, your time to be with him. This is so important in the beginning of the year because he's worthy. Just simply because he's worthy and you're going to enjoy his presence because he's worthy. And he wants to be in fellowship with you. I just love that. That he looks at us and goes, I can be with you. I know I'm holy. I know I'm big. I know I'm God. But I can be with you because of my son Jesus made you worthy. So I have an action step. And many of you may already be having this journey. But I thought if we've gotten a little sloppy or we need to reset because we do that at the beginning of the year. Maybe today you need to set up a divine appointment with God. Like maybe right now you need to write that today at, at, at 5 p.m. I'm going to hang out with him. Or every day this week in the morning or at night I'm going to hang out with him. And I know many of us are already doing this journey of devoting a time to him. But maybe you needed this to help boost you and to help get you in the right direction. Church, remain in him. He is worthy. And he is good. And what's unbelievable is he just longs to fill you up. He longs to give you everything he has, life to the fullest. That's what he longs. And if we slow down long enough, we will find that that's true. I'm literally reading about some random story in the Old Testament in Genesis this past week. And God goes, if you slow down long enough, you will experience me. I'm always there waiting. And you will get exactly what you need. Isn't it interesting how we hurry to get everything we need when actually everything we need is in the stillness of being with God? That's what I have found to be true. My, my father has taught me that. Father, my father has been a pastor for over 40 years, has been serving God his entire life. You know what he told me when I, when I was leaving for college and he was leaving campus? He said, Ryan, I don't care so much about all your grades. Like, you know, don't go below a C. <laughs> but he said, never neglect your time with God. Man, was he right. And he was right. Amen. Praise God. Let me stand together and pray. Let me stand together. <clears throat> God, we were reminded today by your word that you long to be with us and in fellowship with us. We see that through your spirit, by faith, we can continually hang out with you, abide in you, connect with you. We can trust in you and depend on you all day. God, we thank you for that ongoing connection, that you're mobile and always with us. God, I pray that we be intentional to occupy our time with you and our hearts and minds to worship you, to set our lives around you centered around you, God. Help us to do that today. It's a journey, and we need your help. And we know that we will discover more of you and find your strength and your discipline that can return to you every time. And the fact that we're already in you all day, but to be consciously aware that that is true. Help us to do that. Help us to live that way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a great Sunday.